Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the unsurpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as refuse in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own based on law, but that which is through faith in Christ. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Our Mass intention today, as you might expect, as you might desire and as you might demand, is for peace in the Holy Land. For those who have been on our parish pilgrimages in 2019 and 2022, I have uh, reached out to Iyad Kumri, who is our faithful partner and guide in the Holy Land. Iyad and his family, his two sons, run the organization that we've come to know really well. He's been to St. Timothy's. Uh, he came during COVID. And if you are um, planning on going on the pilgrimage in 2024, and if you're on the list for 2026, those dates have already been set. I do hope that the events in which we have witnessed will not deter you from continuing your journey. I hope with everything that this will be resolved before, the, before we go, because this pilgrimage is, is important for you, if you can go, and it's also important for the parish. You know, Fifty people have gone from this parish to the Holy Land. That does something to a community when they return. Because the Holy Land is, is, is a microcosm of the human condition. I mean, if you think about it, it's, it's not a big piece of land. It's, it's you know, an hour from west to east, traveling across. It may be two hours going from south to north, yet in that small tract of land is a stage on which the drama of the human condition is played out. They're focused in that tiny piece of land which has been contested from the beginning of recorded history. We find in ourselves both extremes of hatred and violence and atrocity. But we also find the greatest example of love and mercy and hope. And so it's within the water, borders of that holy land that we discover something about what it means to be a human being, what it means to be alive, to have hope, to struggle, what it means to be a Christian. And what's interesting is, and I, was, I rewrote this homily yesterday, I was going in a different direction, but you can't wake up to news like we saw yesterday and then keep on keeping on, is that that land has really been the source of great tension, where now in our own lives it's difficult for us to imagine two political, political entities that are so opposed in their, in, their, in their goals of how a real lasting peace could be possible in our lifetime. It just seems so fleeting, we get close and it goes away. We have to remember this has been the case to some degree, again, ever since we've ever heard about this land. If you go back in the Old Testament at the end of the book of Exodus, you know, the beginning of Leviticus and Numbers and Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy before they go into the promised land, and the book of Joshua, when Joshua leads the Hebrew people across the Jordan River and they go into the land, this land promised by God, there's been war and violence and rumors of war from the very beginning. All of the Old Testament, most of all the prophets and all those great stories, the backdrop of the Old Testament drama is some invading kingdom, some invading empire that calls the people of Israel and Judah to fidelity. And it's the story of their rebellion, their fall, and their rise. At morning prayer today, the reading was of Hezekiah and the visit of envoys from the Babylonian empire that would take them down. When you read the Old Testament, you have the Assyrians, you have the Babylonians, you have the Persians. The period between the Old and New Testaments, the Greeks have come and conquered everything. And by the time we get to the Gospels, where we read the stories of Jesus Christ, what he said and what he did, the backdrop of that is Roman occupation. 
When Jesus is walking through the temple precincts and walking through the city of Jerusalem, there are Roman soldiers there. We know from the end of the Gospels there's Roman officials there. And we'll hear next Sunday in the Gospel, whenever there's buying and selling, there's Roman coins there. So this tension, this divide, this drama of human history is dripping in the pages of Holy Scripture. And to make sense of what's going on now, we're called to go back and discover the truth and ultimately the good news that was proclaimed in these ancient texts that give us hope and meaning today. What's interesting about this chapter, chapter 21, and I've, in the notices I've given you a brief outline that I hope you will look at, is that um, even though we are now in October, and if you've been to Home Depot or Walmart or on Amazon, it feels like Christmas already. In Matthew's gospel, in today's reading, we're not at Christmas. We are in Holy Week. So 21 is the beginning of the last week of the life of our Lord. It begins with the triumphant entry into Jerusalem. It begins with Palm Sunday. And I think to make sense of what's going on in today's parable, but also to make sense of the bigger picture, we need to read chapter 21 in its larger context. And what's interesting to me is at the end of chapter 20, which is not in the notices, Jesus is walking through and the blind and the lame are crying out to Jesus and praising him. And there are people who want to keep them quiet and they rebuke those voices. And Jesus gives room for those voices to be heard as they are singing praises. So at the very end of chapter 20, we have the divide, the tension between those who have power, those who have a voice, and those who have neither. Then we come into chapter 21, in the triumphant entry, Jesus comes into the city, not on a stallion, not with, with a chariot, and not with soldiers that are armed. He comes with people who are taking off their tattered cloaks and throwing it on the ground, shouting Hosanna, and he's riding a humble animal, a donkey, an ass, as people sing his praises. And then after that, the very next thing that happens is he goes and cleanses the temple. He goes in the temple where money changers, you have to realize to go to the temple where sacrifice is offered, you have to bring a sacrifice to be offered. And if you're traveling from far distances, you're not going to carry this with you. You buy it once you get there. Now, buying it is one thing. Gouging people so they can worship is something else. And these people were profiting significantly on the backs of poor people who wanted to offer their prayers and offer their sacrifices. And Jesus turns the tables over and says, no more. This is a house of prayer. This is not a place where you come to get rich. And then from there, he moves on and he sees a fig tree with his disciples and he sees a tree with leaves but no fruit. And he says this tree is cursed because the reason the fig tree exists is to bear fruit. And the point he was making, and it's building on this, is that the point of existence is to bear fruit. That's what we were made to do. And that fig tree had you know, all bark and no bite. And he was looking at those who had power and had voice and say, you're, you're all talk, but no love, no obedience, no fruit. And we're building on this, because the next thing after he says that, after he's talking about them, now you have the chief priests and the elders who are now saying to him, basically, who do you think you are? And what authority do you have to tell us these things? So Jesus turns it back on them, and he ends that discourse by saying, truly I tell you. And whenever Jesus says, truly I tell you, what comes next is going to be hard. Tax collectors and the harlots will go into the kingdom of God before you. Those people you despise and you keep out and you silence, they'll go in before you will. And then the next thing he does in building on that exchange is tells the parable of two sons working in the vineyard, which was the gospel, or in the fields, which was the gospel last week. And the, the, the point of that story was there was a, a father who had two sons and says, boys, go in the field and do work. One son said, I'm on it, dad, I'm going, but doesn't go. The other son says, basically, it's too hot. I don't want to do it. I'm not going. And then he thinks about it. And then he goes. Jesus asked, which one did the will of the Father? Everyone rightfully said, the one who actually did the work. The point he's making is, like the fig tree, just because you say the right things, just because you have the right associations, just because you have the leaves, doesn't mean you have the fruit. The fruit is what 
is important. And that brings us today, where we still continue with an agrarian fruit image of the parable of the wicked tenants, which Jesus tells this parable, and he's telling stories in the last week of his life. And he tells the story of, of, of a landowner, and this is coming straight from Isaiah 5, the first lesson that Sherilyn read this morning. It comes from Isaiah 5, and Jesus says there was a landowner who, who built a vineyard. He had a, a hedge built around it, a tower, a wine press, vines, and he, he let it out to tenants to come and work the vines to cultivate them so that fruit can come forth. And then they were called to bring that fruit to the wine press, the wine press, so we can make wine strained, clear, aged, something that's good for the soul and brings joy to the heart, a symbol of, of a new life. And they don't do it. And so the landowner sends servants, prophets, to go and remind them, this is what we are called to do as human beings. This is, this is what we do. We, we move toward growth and bearing fruit. We need you to cultivate the vine, which is the human soul, and bring forth fruit. And, and they, they kill them. They reject them. They don't want to hear it. And the landowner says, I'll send my son. They will respect him. Now, you, you can see where this is going. You see how this, this relates. The Son is Jesus Christ, and the Father sends His Son, and they reject Him, and they say, if we kill Him, then we can take His inheritance. And so they kill Him. And that's the parable. So, friends, if, if you look at 21... Triumphant entry, cleansing of the temple, the praise of the blind and the lame, the fig tree, the parable of the two sons, and now the wicked tenants. At the beginning of the last week of our Lord's life on this planet, he is walking through and he is challenging and confronting all that is prideful, greedy, and violent. That's what he addresses. The pride, the greed, and the violence. And I, again, I, I wrote this yesterday, so I'm still thinking this through, but I think this is right. I think all of pride and greed and violence, and in fact, the more I think about it, I think all sin flows from an effort that we have to protect ourselves from losing something. When we feel that something is threatened that we might lose, our reaction can be pride, greed, violence. Think about the worst moments in your life where you reacted poorly, where you regret what you did and how you acted or what you said. Was it because there was a threat that something might be taken from you? Jesus, I think, is highlighting the poor and the blind and the children and the tax collectors and the harlots and all those people that were overlooked, that were looked down upon, that were outcast, that were unable to speak or unable to see or unable to walk or fight because those were precisely the ones that were unable to have greed because they had nothing to begin with. They weren't prideful because they were at the bottom and they had no ability to rise up and be violent. So as he's walking to his cross, he already gives images of the inversion of how things are in society. And he highlights those who have no voice, those who have no ability to fight back, those who have no reason to be prideful. And he points to them and says, this is to whom the kingdom belongs. And to the rest of us, think about the fruit. The thing is, though, when you think about the fear of losing things and how that motivates us, the irony that we see in the gospel again and again and again is that it's a, it's a fool's errand to try to keep all this stuff together and try to accumulate these things out of fear of someone taking something from us because all that we really need has already been given to us. And so that's really kind of the sad ending to some of these stories. I mean, if you, if you go back, for instance, to the, to the parable today of, of the wicked tenants, 
Friends, they didn't build the vineyard. They didn't build the tower or the wine press or the hedge. It wasn't theirs. It was just given to them and simply said, just work it and enjoy the fruits of what, what comes forth. Um, even more so is in the parable of the prodigal son where the eldest son felt like everything was taken from him. But what does the loving father at the end say? It's, it's always been yours. It's always been here. Nothing's been taken from you. It's, it's all been given to you. And the growth in the Christian life of letting all these anxieties and needs to control, of letting them die, and then realizing that all that we really need, all that we really desire in our souls has already been given to us. And so all that struggling of the pride and the greed and the violence is for nothing. It's already been given to you, everything, completely, overflowing. My cup runneth over. That may sound familiar to you. And see, I think this is exactly, when you think about it that way, this is exactly what St. Paul is saying to the Philippians. I mean, St. Paul, writing to the church in Philippi, is talking about all that he tried to gain and then all that he ended up losing. He gives his, his CV, he gives his resume of all the reasons why on paper he's the best of the best. He's a Jew's Jew. He's a Pharisee's Pharisee. He's everything. He's all. He's blameless. He's a persecutor of the church. But at the end, after all that arrogance and greed and violence, he says, I've lost it all. It's all been taken from me, and I give it up so that I may gain Christ. I'm tired of fighting. I'm tired of being greedy. I'm tired of being insecure. I'm letting it all die and go away so that my identity, my hope, my life may be in him. Listen to what he says. He says that he has suffered for the loss of all things and counted them as refuse garbage in order that he might gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of his own that he's fighting for based on law, but that which is through faith in Christ, which has been given to him freely. He gave it all up so that he might be full. I think this is what Jesus is, is talking about in those, in, those, in those parables, in those stories, when he talks about, if you want to follow me, you have to follow me fully. And I think what he's saying is, if you want to follow me and be alive in me, you have to allow me to live completely in you. And so when he says, for instance, that, that, that if you put your hand on the plow and look back, you're not fit for the kingdom of God, that's harsh. When, when he says to the man who says, I love you, I want to follow you, I want to be your disciple, I need to go bury my dad first. And Jesus says, let the dead bury the dead. That hurts. But I think he's getting our attention in saying these harsh words. I think what he's saying is we can all find something to cling to that will hold us back, that we try to protect, that will ultimately be a seed for pride or greed or violence. He's saying, let it all die. You don't have to fight. Let it all die that I may live in you. Because you cannot find peace through violence or greed or arrogance, not between nations, not between individuals, and certainly not between ourselves and God. But the final thing is this, and this is, this is something I hope we all hear clearly, is that in the parable of the wicked tenants, when everything is destroyed based on the wickedness and rebellion of the people, this wonderful image of perfection is now broken because of their infidelity. Jesus says, the stone that was rejected has now become the chief corner, has become the cornerstone. And you can see in your notices how this is repeated all through the New Testament in, by, by St. Luke, by, by Peter, by Paul, all of them, the idea that Jesus Christ is the cornerstone. What that means is, is that that which was rejected by everyone, Jesus Christ, nailed to the cross, crucified, dead, and buried, that scandal, that image of arrogance and greed and violence concentrated on wood and nails has now become the foundation in which we discover new life. That is our entrance into new life. We go through that gate that was built by brokenness and violence and hate to discover what is generous, what is loving, what is good. Jesus responded to all the arrogance and greed and violence with humility and generosity and love. But that also means that when he gives us this way for new life, that means that that which is broken in you, that which you have broken in maybe someone else, 
can and will be used by Jesus Christ to be the foundation on which you build your new life in him. That which is broken in you and what you have broken in others, that which is scandalous to us and shameful to us that we want to go away, is used so that we can understand what mercy is all about, what love truly means, so that we understand this way that he has given to us. So it doesn't matter what mess you've made or what you've broken or how you've rebelled or how you've responded to calls to bear fruit. What matters is that there is a new life offered, freely given to you, that you don't have to fight for. You have nothing to lose because in him we've lost it all so that we may gain everything. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.